Uh, good evening, my name is Joyce Kennedy, and I'm the Director of Community Relations here at Concordia College, and I welcome all of you to tonight's program. We're really excited and fortunate to have Ken Doka return to campus, who is an alumni, an esteemed professor, and also an LCMS pastor, so he checks off many of our boxes, <laughs> but we're very happy to have him here tonight. The program will go as this. Uh, Christina Stout, who is the president of the Westchester End of Life Coalition, will introduce Ken. Thank you very much all for coming out on this very evening. It's terrific to see so many that we even have an overflow audience. So welcome to the overflow audience as well in next door. <laughs> as Joyce mentioned, I'm president of Westchester End of Life Coalition, also known as Live With Care. Our organization gives, helps families uh, get guidance and information to be prepared for serious illness and at the end of life. And we're very happy to ha uh, be with Ken Doka tonight and to have an opportunity to sponsor this event with, uh, together with Concordia College. Ken Doka has been an advisor to our organization since its very early years. And it's a pleasure and an honor to introduce Reverend Dr. Mm -hmm. Kenneth Doka. Uh, Dr. Doka, for him, uh, as uh, Joyce Kennedy mentioned, it's a bit of a homecoming here. He graduated from Concordia College. He's been an associate professor here, and he remains an advisor to the Division of Nursing. Dr. Uh, Doka was also the college's first recipient of the Distinguished Alumnus Award, which is only one of the many awards conferred on him. Others include the Association for Deaf Education and Counseling's Award for Outstanding Contribution in the Field of Deaf Education, the Caring Hands Award, and the prestigious Dr. Robert Fulton Founders Award from the University of Wisconsin La Crosse for Outstanding University Teaching, Research, Publication, and Professional Service in the Field of Deaf, Dying, and Bereavement. And indeed, Dr. Doka fulfills all those roles. He is a popular professor of gerontology at the Graduate School of the College of New Rochelle. A prolific and celebrated author, he has published and edited more than 30 books and written uh, over 100 articles and chapters. He is also the editor of Omega, the Journal of Death and Dying, and of Journeys, a newsletter to health in bereavement. He has held a number of distinguished positions, including president of the Association of Death Education and Counseling. He is a senior advisor of the Hospice Foundation of America. In 1995, he was selected to the board of directors of the International Work Group on Dying, Death, and Bereavement, and he served as its chair for two years. An ordained Lutheran minister with profound understanding of the diverse approaches individuals of different backgrounds and personalities have to death and dying and to the struggle with grief. Dr. Doka is sought after in many places as a keynote speaker all over the United States and around the world. He participates in highly regarded national teleconferences and has appeared on CNN and Nightline. In addition, he has served as a consultant to medical, nursing, funeral service, and hospice organizations, as well as to businesses and educational and social service agencies. Tonight, Reverend Dr. Kenneth Doka will share his thoughts and research from his most recent book, Grief is a Journey, Finding Your Path Through Loss. Welcome, Dr. Doka. Thank you very much. I have to tell you that once when my son, who's now in his 40s, when he was in his 20s, came to a seminar where I was introduced as warmly as Christina's introduced me, um, he, we, it was a ski seminar, so, and I wasn't teaching skiing, but, uh, but it was a seminar in a ski resort where, you know, uh, the presentations were uh, before nine and after four, uh, allowing the day for reflection and study, I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> But uh, so he came with me. He was he was a college student at the time, and um, and he and it's, you know it's the first time he heard an introduction to me because your kids don't often know what you do, and he summarized it very neatly. He said, "Dad, you know what that introduction was was impressive, 
I said, thank you, son. You know, very proud that your son hears this, you know. And he said, what it really translates as to is you have no life. Uh, so I guess you could read that in a lot of different ways. Um, as, as Christine said, I am delighted to be back. Concordia is very special in my life. I was a student here from 1965 to 1967 and a faculty member here from 1973 to 1981. Uh, so it's a place where I count lots of friends and um, lots of good memories and lots of good times as both, uh, as both a student and a faculty. You've heard a little bit about me. Let me get a sense of who you are. Um, how many of you are actually presently involved in end-of-life care in one way or another? Okay. How many of you are from the community hearing, you know, just good? Okay. How many of you are students at Concordia? All right, let me check around that. Um, and nursing students? Uh, okay, other programs, uh, sociology, social work, okay, social work, sociology, social work. social work, anybody else that I didn't mention, psychology, okay, so I pretty much covered everybody, this is your chance, I don't want to disenfranchise you, <laughs> okay, well let me tell you about, about um, grief as a journey, and um, you know, I've written a number of books in the field, but a number of years ago, an agent approached me and said, you know, most of the books that you've written are for professional audiences, and we'd like you, would you be interested in doing something um, that would be more of what my son likes to call a Barnes and Noble book, you know, the kind of book you'd find in bookstores and like. And I really thought about that for a while, um, and I thought, yeah, I really would. Um, because I think one of the problems that we have is there are so many myths of grief. Um, and, you know, and there are so many, and I'm going to talk about those myths in a minute. So I thought there's so much misunderstanding of grief out there, and I really wanted to, to write a book that really incorporated the most current research and most current feeling that would really be aimed at people who are really working through a loss or supporting people who are working through a loss. Um, so I, what I wanted to do was to validate grief, uh, because I think one of the things that helps most is just knowing, you know, when, when I do lectures like this throughout the country, one of the questions I get asked most often uh, is a variation of the question, am I going crazy? You know, it's been six months, it's been eight months, uh, I'm still grieving, am I, go am I going crazy? Uh, you know, I was doing better uh, before, right after the funeral than I'm doing now, am I going crazy? It, you know, it's all of a sudden, the holidays were very tough for me, am I going crazy? And most of the time what we realize is no, you're just grieving. But again, there's not a lot of information about grieving out there. And then I wanted to give advice for coping with loss and then to explore special kinds of losses. And one of my areas, particularly, is, is the area of what I call disenfranchised grief. And disenfranchised grief refer to losses that people have that aren't always acknowledged or recognized by others. Um, a number of years ago, I got into that field actually in, in, in the 1980s, uh, when I was talking to students in my class, and I teach graduate students, and most of them are adults who've had some life experience and, you know, and have come back to college, and we were talking about the grief of widows. And one of the women said, if you think widows have it tough, you ought to see what happens when your ex-spouse dies. And I never thought about that. That was what I call a, you know, a, a two-by-four moment, when you sort of get hit by a two-by-four. You know, and I said, yeah, and I, I started to do research on that. What is it like when an ex-spouse dies? You know, and think about it. You're connected with this person for a long time, you, or maybe a long time. You may share children with that person. You may have very ambivalent relationships with that person. Um, so I did some research on that, and that was very, very interesting, and I thought, well, let me take this a step further. I said, what about when you're involved in an affair with somebody, an extramarital affair with somebody, and all of a sudden, um, you know, uh, that person dies? What happens then? Well, those of you who are research-oriented will realize how hard it is to find that sample. Um, so I, I ended up uh, broadening it to people who are involved in intimate relationships without benefit of marriage. Couples who lived together, couples who had long-time dating relationships but never married, uh, you know, gay and straight, couples who had affairs. And, uh, and I presented that paper and I had a very interesting reaction. That was the first time I used the term disenfranchised grief. That people, because one person said to me, I had this significant loss but I had no right to grieve this loss. Mm -hmm. 
And then other people came up to me and said, this is like when. This is like when my coach died in high school. This is like when, uh, and so I began to write about and research disenfranchised grief. And so I wanted to talk about the, the different kinds of losses that people grieve and, and to emphasize that we don't just, and Freud had this right, that we don't just grieve deaths. We grieve the significant losses in our lives. Um, you know, it's interesting. You know, Freud would do case studies on every article. The really the beginning of the scientific study of grief is almost about 100 years old in, in Freud's article, about 100 years ago, uh, called Mourning and Melancholia. And you know how Freud always starts with a case study? Anybody want to guess what his case study was in Mourning and Melancholia? Some of you might be thinking a widow. Some of you might be thinking a bereaved parent. Some of you might be thinking a bereaved child. It was a woman abandoned at the altar. And I think Freud was telling us something, that grief is about loss. And whenever we experience something significant, that we're attached to something or someone, when we lose that, that thing or that person or even that animal, we grieve. So I wanted to talk about that in this book as well. And I wanted to talk about some of the myths. And, and probably the first and one of the most pervasive myths is how many of you ever heard about the five stages of grief? How many of you can repeat those? How many, and I want you all to forget them. <laughs> because what we realize now is that people don't go through predictable stages. That every journey is a very distinct and individual journey. That grief is distinct as, as fingerprints or, uh, or snowflakes. You know, when you, when you think about it, it's kind of funny to think, here we are, we're all different. We come from different cultures. We come from different spiritualities. We come from different ethnicities, different classes. We've had different experiences in life. We cope differently. And then all of a sudden, we're going to deal with a crisis and all cope with it in identical ways. Doesn't really make much sense. Another myth is that grief has a timetable. You know, um, six months, and you should be better. 12, 12 months, and you should be better. Um, there is no timetable for grief. It's a journey you go through in life. Love has no expiration date. And, and what I mean by that then is that, you know, that even years later, you may have experiences decades later where all of a sudden you fervently miss somebody who died. And that's also normal. Often throws people. Uh, I have a strange ex uh, background for Lutheran. I'm half Hungarian and half Hispanic. I think that puts me in a very distinct class among Lutherans. Um, but, um, but coming from an Hispanic culture, um, we take godparenting very seriously in, in our culture, uh, in that culture. Uh, we even call them comadres, compadres, meaning you parent with, you father with, your mother with. And when, my grand, when, when one of my godsons was four years old, his father died. And so we developed a very close relationship. And I sort of became a father figure in his life. Ironically, he's a rapper now. <laughs> I don't... Uh, so you can follow him as Concept One with a K uh, if you want to look, look him up. Some of you know him? Uh, Concept One. He's in South Korea now. Evidently, he does better in Asia than he does in this country. Uh, but, um, but in any case, um, so one of the traditions I had with Keith, uh, my godson, is on his birthdays, I would always take him out for his birthday to have dinner with me, and his mother would prepare what we called the adult party. And when he turned 16, I got a call from his mother. He's in his 30s now. And he said, you better be prepared, his mother said. Uh, Keith's got his driver's permit today, 16th birthday upstate. And she said, so when you pick him up, he's going to ask to drive your car. It's your decision. It's your car. Um, you, know, uh, you know, whatever you decide is fine, but just be prepared that you're going to face this crisis. So I pull up, and all of a sudden, this 16-year-old comes running out, triumphantly waving his permit, and says, can I drive? And I said, OK, you can drive. You know, we weren't going that far. And of course, the, the dirty secret about living upstate New York, if some of you may know it, when the first kid in the crowd gets, gets his license in his car, everybody else gets driver's license. And if they're 14, 13, you know, whoever he's hanging out with starts driving. Um, but all of a sudden, and his father died the day before his fourth birthday. All of a sudden, as I'm in the car with this boy, uh, and he's driving very well, um, I, start, I start getting teary-eyed. 
because I'm thinking this is a moment that his dad should be here. You know, this is a father-son moment. And Keith looks at me and he sees my eyes water up and he gets a little defensive. He says, I'm driving well. <laughs> I, I said, no, I said, it's not you. I said, I really miss your dad, who is a good friend of mine. And he got very soft in his voice and said, I miss him too. You know, grief doesn't have a timetable. Even years later, we may have surges of grief. Another myth is that we have to detach. This is one of the areas where Freud didn't get it right. Uh, we never detach from the people we love. Um, they always stay with us. Um, we never, and that's why I always say closure's a myth. You know, people say, you know, when you go to the funeral, it'll bring closure. Uh, when you go, if it's a court case, that'll bring closure. You know, the first anniversary will definitely bring closure. I always tell my students, bring closure to the idea of closure. We always stay with people. They always, and, and as I said, grief is not about death. And we also have to recognize that not everyone grieves in the same way. And some people are very resilient about loss. And they have more limited reactions. And that's fine too. You know, and I'm going to talk about some of these a little bit more as we go on. Well, the first thing you probably want to know, and this is one of the things I've learned over the years, how many of you have ever, have ever experienced grief? I'm sure most of you in this class have, right? And how would you like to avoid it? I can teach you how to avoid it. I can teach you that you never will have to grieve alone. Very simple procedure. All you have to do is avoid any attachment to anything or anyone. <laughs> if you never become attached to anything, that includes pets, people, things, anything, you'll never grieve. One of my teachers used to say, Colin Murray Parks, grief is the price we pay for love. Grief is the cost of love. And what is grief? Well, it's a reaction to loss. It's very, very individual. As I said, each of us grieves in our own way. It depends on a relationship, you know? Uh, it depends on what, who we grieve. I used to have another teacher, Rabbi Earl Grohman, who used to say that when we lose a child, we lose our sense of future. When we lose a parent, we lose our past. When we lose a spouse, we lose our present. The truth is, with every loss, we lose a piece of our present, our past, and our future. Uh, but each relationship does matter. It, it not only matters the nature of the relationship, it matters the kind of attachment we have. Um, some relationships we have are very ambivalent. You know, how many of you have relationships where you love the person but you can't stand to be with them sometimes? <laughs> you don't have to talk about which relationship that is in your life, you know? Um, and those relationships are actually tougher to grieve because there's a lot of unfinished business. There's a lot of I wish I would have or I wish I didn't. There's a lot of if onlys. Um, so those relationships are very tough. You know, um, I have a wonderful relationship. I have one child. He's um, going to be 45. I have a wonderful relationship with him and his family. My, my eldest grandson is named after, my only grandson is named after me. Um, so I'm, you know, very good relationship. When he was between 13 and 15, um, I used to say, I love my son. I don't particularly like him, but I do love him. And I'm sure he said things like, you know, when, it, when, I got, when he got in his 20s, he gave me a gift with that famous quote from Mark Twain. Remember that quote from Mark Twain? Mark Twain said, uh, when I ran away from home at 14, I ran away because my father was the dumbest man on the face of the earth. When I came back seven years later, I was amazed how much he learned. <laughs> my son gave me that, you know, so I think that was a statement. Um, you know, I know a lot about child psychology and development, so I understand what happened in those years. Aliens abducted my true son. Uh, <laughs> returned him back on his 16th birthday. That's a whole other story. The circumstances of life and death will affect our grief. Did somebody die suddenly? Did we expect it? Did we not expect it? Uh, was it violent? Was it, uh, and again, it doesn't make it easier. It just makes it different. Another thing might be what kind of support do we have, both internally and externally? Are there people we can talk to? Do we have our, our, a spirituality that helps us understand this? What is our own health? Uh, it's easier to cope with a loss if we're physically healthy and mentally healthy. It's harder if we're struggling with other issues, whether issues of physical health or mental health. Uh, and then how does our culture and spirituality influence our grief? So grief is very unique. We all have our own individual pathways. We all have our own individual experiences. 
How many of you have ever had physical reactions to grief? I mean, you really feel physically sick, right? A number of years ago, one of my colleagues, um, a woman by the name of Jane Nichols, a real pioneer, did research out of her own experiences with perinatal loss, miscarriages and stillbirths. And what she found out, now remember, she was doing this research in the 70s. And in the 70s, you couldn't find a hallmark, you literally could not find a hallmark card for a miscarriage or, you know, or, or a stillbirth. There was really no support. Any counseling that you got was, you're young, you're healthy, go get pregnant again. There was no support for women who had this. And she decided to do research on this to really show the need for support. And she found out that most of the women that she studied would report tremendous physical pain because that was the only kind of pain that was supported. You know, so if they said, I'm emotionally doing bad, they'd say, well, get over it. Remember, you know, you, it, was just a, it was just a stillbirth. There's nothing. Uh, and she knew better. Anybody want to guess where, the, where the, these women reported the most major pain? What do you think the site of pain was? My nursing student's here. What? Stomach, womb, uterus, number three. Heart, breast, number two. Biggest source of pain was in their upper arms. And it makes perfect sense when you hear the, the title of her article, The Empty Arm Syndrome in Women Who Experience Perinatal Loss. These are the muscles you would use to cradle, to lift, to hold a child. These were the muscles that hurt. They ached. In other words, they ached literally because they were empty. Um, we experience grief emotionally. What kinds of emotions do we have with grief? Anger. What? Anger. anger. Good that you said anger. Most people don't say anger. But I always give this, you know what the term bereaved actually comes from? A term meaning, I don't know how many of you are from the 70s or remember language in the 70s. Uh, but we used to use a term when something was stolen from you being ripped off. You know, and, and that was the, that was, um, that was what bereavement comes from, to have something ripped away from you. Anger. Anybody else? Sadness. Loneliness. Yearning. Right? Another big one, guilt. We often feel guilty. Now, again, I'm showing my age. Any of you remember the song, Love is a Many Splendored Thing? Okay. And some of you are saying, is that a Beatles thing? I know, but... Uh, <laughs> Um, but love is a many splendored thing. The truth is guilt is a many splendored thing. And, and researchers have found that people feel guilt about all kinds of things. They'll feel guilt about causation. I should have, I should have caught this earlier. It doesn't have to be rational to be real. You know, I've had lots of people come into me and say, I should have made them stop smoking. You know, as if they had the power to do that. It can be moral guilt. This is a punishment. It could, be, uh, it could be role guilt. I should have been a better, and you can fill in the sentence, brother, sister, mother, father, son. It could be survivor guilt. I'm still alive, and they're dead. Siblings often experience that. Um, it could be all kinds. It can be grief, guilt about your grief. Uh, I'm doing badly. My father would not be proud to see how I'm doing. Or guilt about recovery. I'm doing too well. We can have all kinds of guilt. It can affect how we think. We can idealize the person who died. We can be distracted. We can be confused. We can be disoriented. How we behave and even affect us spiritually. So grief affects us in a very individual pattern, each one of us. And again, one of my work, uh, one, one part of my work has been on styles of grief that, you know, um, that there are different pathways. Uh, and it, it's sort of a continuum. Some people I call intuitive grievers. Intuitive grievers are grievers who, when you ask them how did they experience grief, they'll often, and again, think of it as a continuum. People can be all over this continuum. But an intuitive griever will say, I, I, I just had waves of feelings, you know? And you'll say, okay, how did that grief come out? And what they've done is externalize their feelings. I cried, I shouted, I screamed. And they say, what helps? When you say what helps to them, intuitive grievers say, I needed to find space um, to talk about my feelings, to explore them, to resolve them. Now on the other end of the continuum, and a lot of men find themselves on the other end of this continuum, are what we call instrumental grievers. They do their grief. So when you, uh, 
when you ask them, uh, how did you grieve, they may be surprised by that question. They said, I don't know if I did, but I talked about the person a lot. Um, and when you say, how did you experience grief, uh, or how did you express grief, again, they, they may not know, but often how they adopt is by doing. We had one person who talked to us in our study who said when his daughter died, uh, and his daughter died, a 16-year-old girl, new driver in Maryland, coming fast around her home street, a little bit late for a curfew, a January night with a lot of ice on the street, uh, new driver, her car spilled over, and she went through a neighbor's picket fence. Uh, and not wearing a seatbelt, she died instantly. And this guy said, on the day my daughter was buried, literally the day he was, she was buried, I went out and I started fixing the neighbor's picket fence. And she said the neighbor, he said the neighbor came out and said, John, you don't even have to do this. Don't worry about this. You don't have to do this, she kept saying. And he said, no, I do. He said, this is the only part of the accident I could fix, and I need to fix it. It was the most therapeutic thing I did. So again, you know, um, we have our own grieving styles, and how we grieve is not a measure of our love. We all grieve just differently. So you can't say, oh, this person's crying all the time. I guess she loved that person more. We grieve in our own ways, our own unique ways. And it's a roller coaster. Um, it's, it, now, I, I'm very careful when I say that with metaphors, because if you were my client, I might give you that metaphor. But you have to be careful with therapeutic metaphors, because my first question to you would be, do you ever go on a roller coaster? And you might say, uh, I used to go on them when I was a kid. I used to love them when I was a kid. And I said, well, grief is kind of like a roller coaster. But if you said to me, I was always dreadfully afraid of roller coasters, I wouldn't want to turn to you and say, well, grief is like a roller coaster. <laughs> that would not be a helpful metaphor for you. I might use another metaphor. Uh, you know, it's a dual process. We're dealing both with two issues. We're dealing with the fact that something we love has is, is left us, died, divorced, and we have to deal with the, the internal reactions to that. And then we have to adjust to a new life now that's different. And so we have good days and we have bad days. We have some days that are predictably bad and some days that aren't, uh, that maybe that we didn't predict but are bad. I had one of my students tell a story of the fact that, um, that she had a woman come to her. And, and she always asked the woman, how are you doing today? And the woman said, you know, it's funny. When I started, when I got up this morning, I was doing well. And then when I got in the car to come to see you, I just sort of plunged, you know, using the roller coaster metaphor. And she said, well, was it coming to see me that made you plunge? You know, wondering about that. And, and she said, no, that's why I think I woke up feeling so good. And then when she came back that day, she called up the counselor, my student counselor, and she said, I, I figured it out. She says, when I opened the car door coming home, I realized I smelled lilacs. And the, the student said, and lilacs remind you of your mother? And she said, yeah. She said, my mother would buy this awful toilet water, you know, this, this <laughs> that was in these big packages, you know, big jars of uh, bottles of, of light purple liquid, and would have this overwhelming smell of lilacs. And she said, every birthday, every Christmas, I'd give her some exquisite perfume, and I'd smell it on her the next time, and then it'd be the damn lilacs. <laughs> and so, you know, without even noticing it, she smelt the lilacs and was plunged into that. And again, there are no universal stages. There are personal pathways, and some of those pathways are resilience. Oops. You know, some of you may be wondering if you've had a loss, if you're actually doing too well. You might say, why am I not feeling it more strongly? And some people do have a comparatively limited reaction to loss. Part of it is the situation. Maybe they're, you know, they're not undergoing other stress. The death was not so sudden. They didn't have a chance to say goodbye. They have a good psychological you know, uh, health. Um, but again, we can look at that. Resilient grievers um, generally have an optimistic t mindset. They, you know, they're the people who say, I may be grieving, it may be tough, but I'm going to get through this. I know I'm going to get through this. Um, that they respond to challenges and a belief that even in the worst things, there are opportunities for growth and development. And they focus on positive memories. So some of you may be resilient grievers. Uh, and even if you're not resilient, one of the things we've learned is it's not just about coping with loss, but some people do grow with loss. We learn new skills. We have a deeper spirituality. So there's no timetable to grief. 
over time, the pain lessens. This is what I call amelioration. I don't even like to use terms like recovery or resolution. Uh, today, when I was leaving class, I was thinking I have to come to Concordia tonight. I was, you know, uh, watching the time. And, uh, and when I left class, I actually left my cell phone on the desk. And then all of a sudden, one of my graduate students ran down with me uh, and got me just as I, uh, as I was leaving camp and said, you forgot this. That's recovery. <laughs> Resolution is maybe I didn't get it, so I stop in Verizon tomorrow and pick up a new one. Um, that doesn't happen with grief. I like to use the term amelioration. That means that over time, the pain lessens. We return to similar, sometimes better levels of functioning. We do grow in grief. We do learn new things. We do appreciate new relationships. How many of you, when you've had a loss, found that you, you really recognized how important people are to you, or you've learned something about your own resilience or your own coping skills. And yet we always continue a bond, and that's why we'll sometimes have surges of grief. And again, the bonds we may have may be in our memories, right? You know, we all have memories of the, of the things we loved and the, the people we loved. In our biography, if you know me, you see some of my father in me, you see some of my mother in me. You know, you could recognize that I'm Dot's kid brother and Frankie's kid brother. The legacies. Every morning uh, when I wake up, first thing I do is make a color-coded list of things I have to do today. Okay? I will cross out Concordia at 9 o'clock. Uh, my father did that. My son does that. My grandson and granddaughter do it, don't do it yet, but they're young. We hope, you know, they like colors. Uh, we think they're strong possibilities. Then we have extraordinary experiences. That's also a kind of bond. Uh, let me tell you what extraordinary experiences are, and let me ask how many of you have actually had one of these. We don't often talk about these, but this is actually very common in, re, in, in our research. Extraordinary experiences are experiences like this, where we may have a dream of the deceased, you know, it comes in our dreams. Uh, we may have a sense experience of the person that, you know, maybe all of a sudden that young woman who, who was grieving her mother may smell lilac perfume in her house. Uh, or, or all of a sudden have an image where somebody's walking down the street and for a moment they think it's their, their husband or, or their wife. Um, it may come out in, um, in experiences like... Um, you know, just a sense of presence, not a sense experience, but just a sense of presence. Um, it may come out in, in more symbolic experiences. Lou Legrand did a lot of research on this, and his first experience was a counseling case. And a woman came to him and said, um, I had this, 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 you know, and he said, how are you doing? He said, I had this really weird experience. Uh, whenever I come to see you, I pass my son's um, cemetery. So we stop at the cemetery, and, she, she, and her son had died as, a, as an adolescent. And she said, when I stopped at the cemetery today, there was a hawk sitting on the memorial stone. He didn't fly away right away. He kind of looked at me and then slowly flew away. And Lou Legrand said to her, and, and that has significance to you? And she said, yeah, my son's nickname was Hawkeye. You know, uh, so, you know, we have all these different kinds of extraordinary, sometimes it may even be a third person experience where somebody else says something to you that, that just seems to reinforce. My son had one of those. Uh, he was very close to my mother, uh, his grandmother. And, uh, and one of the things that, that would happen with him is, uh, is when he first moved to New York City, uh, and he was looking for an apartment. He lived, he, we live in Poughkeepsie, so he had just finished college. He was getting an apartment, and he lived with my mother for the first few months uh, as he was working. Um, and, uh, and that was good for her, and it was good for him. Um, and my mother uh, used to read from a journal that my father had written. My father had died some years before, and every morning she'd read from that journal. And so one day, um, 
my, uh, she called up my son at work and she said, Michael, did you see the journal? I can't find it. And he said, no, Grandma, I don't know where it is, but don't worry about it. He says, I'm going to come home tonight and we'll look for it. And it's got to be in the house. We haven't taken out the garbage. So it's somewhere in the house and we'll make sure we find it. And she was very relieved. My sister called later and she said, I can't find the journal, but Michael's going to find it tonight. She had a terrible accident where she fell downstairs and ended up in a, in a hospital comatose and ultimately died in a few days. And my son found the journal and every day would go to the hospital after work and read to her from the journal. You know, very touching uh, grandson, uh, grandmother moment. And when he died, my son took comfort from the fact, well, maybe the journal was a sign. Maybe she didn't need the journal anymore because grandpa was going to tell her what he, you know, about his love. She wouldn't have to read about it. Uh, sorry, it's a hard story to tell. And then one day, Michael's walking up the street where I grew up on and where our family has lived for five generations. And one of the neighbors came up to him and said, Michael, my wife had the most wonderful dream. She dreamed that your mother and father were walking up the street hand in hand together. And that kind of reinforced his notion of, of what that death was all about. Very, very important. How many of you ever had any of those experiences with the loss? Yeah, studies have shown about 60% of grievers do. And then we may have spiritual connections, whatever we believe about it. And so I think it's important to, to recognize, and some people hold on to their grief because they're afraid if they stop grieving, they're going uh, to stop the connection. And the answer is no. You know, I always tell people the first sign, and I say this in the book, the first sign of recovery, the first amelioration, the first sign that you're doing better is when you can laugh at a story that's now too painful to recall. Uh, you know, grief is a not about the ending of connection. When grief is sudden, we have different challenges because not only does it challenge our sense of the death, it challenges, um, it challenges our sense of the fairness of the world. So again, um, what can help? Well, you know, Catherine Sanders um, was interesting. Um, Catherine Sanders said that one of the things that happen is that most people who go through grief talk, you know, talk about first a sense of shock and then a sense of awareness of loss uh, where the pain is very high, they're, they're really very aware of their loss and then they go through a phase that she called conservation and withdrawal where they, they're just sort of surviving and then she said many people, not everybody, many people have a turning point experience where all of a sudden they say, I've got to get better. I can't stay here. And those people have a sense of renewal. And William Warden, uh, again, one of my colleagues and teachers and friends, says, well, you know, to do better, you have to do a certain number of things. You have to accept the reality of the loss. And again, talking about the loss, rituals around the loss help. You have to deal with your emotions, whatever they are. Uh, and some of us may have profound emotions that we have to work through. We have to deal with a life without the person. Um, assessing change, coping with, with loneliness, you know, relearning the world, really. You know, if you've lived with somebody 50 years, if you've slept with somebody for 50 years, you have to learn how to sleep alone now. You know, it's a relearning process. We have to draw from our strengths. We have to acknowledge the secondary losses. One of the things that was most profound for me is when I was counseling a woman whose 19-year-old son had died from a brain aneurysm, she said something that put chills through my body. She said, not only did I lose my son, I simultaneously lost all of his friends. And I thought about that, and I thought about how full our house is with kids, you know, all over the time, you know, when my son was growing up, that, you know, these kids were always in and out. Um, so we have those secondary losses. And, and one of the tricks that I always talk about is finding good support. And I have this kind of neat way of doing that. Um, I ask people to write down their support system. And then I say, okay, when you have your whole support system written down, put a D next to the people who are good doers. You ask them, you know, it's going to get done. I have a neighbor like that. When I'm traveling, I ask him to bring in my mail. I don't have to call him. I don't have to remind him. I know my mail is going to be waiting for me on the kitchen table. He gets a D for doer. L are good listeners. You can call them up anytime. Now, my, my good friend, my neighbor, is not a good listener. He doesn't get an L. <laughs> if you tell him what your problem is, he'll tell you five ways it shouldn't be a problem and five things you can do about it. And then R are for respite people. 
Grief is hard work. And we need people in our life who will take us away from it. P you know, and, and it's fun on this one because often people get annoyed at respite people. Because this is the person they'll say, you know, she's my best friend or one of my good friends. And whenever we go out together, she never mentions my loss. She never asks me how I'm doing. We joke a lot. We have a good dinner. We have a lot of fun. And I remind them, that's her role. Her role is to take you away from your grief. And people begin to appreciate that. We also have to figure out how we're going to continue the bond. And Catherine Sanders, by the way, who was a researcher but also a bereaved mother, said she would ask three questions. What do I wish to take from my old life into my new life? What do I want to leave behind? What do I need to add? And then we also have to look at our beliefs because our beliefs can be challenged by loss. And we have to ask the question, how does my faith, how does my philosophy speak to me now? Some losses will really cause us to really question our faith. Some losses won't. And again, you know, one of the things that's nice about now compared, I've been in this field for 45 years. I started at 11. No, I'm only kidding. I started at 23. Um, but, um, but if you, um, you know, one of the things that's so much richer now is there are so many more resources. Counselors who are trained, self-help groups, books. And sometimes we can create rituals uh, that help us mark points in our grief. Sometimes it's just a simple ritual of continuity. A ritual of continuity is a ritual that says, you're still part of my life. We have one in our house. Every Christmas, the first three ornaments we put on. The tree are ornaments to my parents and to my godson's father. Rituals of transition, which say I've moved. One of my most fascinating rituals of transition that I was ever involved in as a counselor was a woman who came to me and she said, um, it's been three years since my husband died. I want to start dating again. She was a middle-aged woman. She says, but I can't seem to take off my wedding ring. Whenever I take off my wedding ring, I get teary-eyed. I put it back on. I can't date with it, but I can't seem to take it off. And we talked about what the ring meant to her, and it meant a great deal to her. And during the course of the illness, uh, as she said, my husband was a vital young man before he developed Lou Gehrig's disease, and he died within three years. And she said he did not do sick well. So every night when we got together, we'd put our fingers together, and our rings would touch, and we'd repeat our wedding vows in sickness and in health. So we created a ritual for her to take off her ring. When she went back to the church and she was married, and the priest called her up to the altar and gave, in front of her family and friends, gave her the vows in the past tense. Were you faithful in sickness and in health, in good times and in bad? And she said the ring came as off, off as by magic. And then the priest took the ring, and she still had his ring because by the time he died it was so loose on his finger that she kept it. And he had them interlocked and welded to the frame of her wedding picture. This was a vow that was now complete. Other kinds of rituals are rituals of reconciliation, where you say, I'm sorry, or rituals of affirmation. I told you about my godson, Keith. One of the rituals that we had is, um, I, I met Keith's father when I was at Concordia, uh, where a friend of mine uh, in, involved me in a delinquency prevention program. And so they, what they wanted was they wanted kids who grew up in Astoria, New York, which is where I grew up before it was fashionable. Um, <laughs> and um, to mentor kids who were at risk for delinquency. And his father wasn't at risk for delinquency. His father was quite delinquent. Um, he had long past the, the you know, and we, it was what I call a classic 70s program. No training, no support, no supervision, just go out and do it. Um, and so we, I did. And, uh, and this, this kid became like a little brother to me. And we would, um, i take him fishing a lot. That was what I was into in those days. And he would constantly lose lures on me. And one day, um, he threw in my tackle box about six new lures. And I looked at them, and I said, Michael, are these hot? <laughs> and he looked at me and had this really innocent face. And he said, I would tell you if they were hot. And I said, I'm sorry. I had to ask. And about five years later, we're fishing. And he said, you still have the hot lures. <laughs> and I said, wait a minute. We had this honesty thing. You, 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 know, I, you told me they weren't hot. And he said, no. He said, I remember exactly what I told you. He said, I said, I would tell you if they were hot. Then he smiled. He said, I never said when I would tell you. <laughs> They're hot. Keith loves that story. I told that story at his father's funeral when he was four. Loved that story. And, uh, and one day we're going upstate with my son and, and, uh, and, and Kathy, my partner. And as we're going upstate, I said, Keith, 
that's where that story took place that you love. And he said, stop the car. And we found this old rusted lure. And Keith got a big kick out of that. And he said, this is a gift from my dad. So we developed a ritual around it where I gave him the gift, the lure, and I said, this is a gift from your dad, but the best gift I ever got from your dad was you. And he gave me the lure and said, this is a gift from my dad, but the best, well, actually, we did it the other way around. Uh, and then he threw it and said, thank you, dad. Sometimes we need a ritual just to say thanks. And again, what I always tell my group in the, when they're experiencing, uh, when I run a self-help group, is I always say, let's look at a year from now. You know, this is our last meeting. It's March, what today's date, March 28th? It's March 28th. So suppose I meet you on March 28th, 2018. I meet you in the supermarket. And I say, I haven't seen you since our group ended. How are you doing? What are you going to tell me? And, the, and it's interesting that most people become very optimistic then. They say, I'm doing better. Um, it's still been rough. I'm still on a roller coaster, but I'm doing better. And my hope with people who read the book, who grieve, uh, who get support from wherever they get it, is that over time, their grief does ameliorate. Thank you very, very much. presentation with a lot of uh, things for us to ponder and ask questions about. Uh, I'll just uh, bring up some of the things that uh, came to my mind. And uh, when you spoke about the continuing bond, I think you know one thing uh, that can be added to that, I think, is that the person you're thinking back on changes. Uh, you look back as you change. Um, my sister died relatively recently, a couple of years ago. My mother died maybe five years ago. And I still turn to them for advice. And this is for situations that they have had nothing to do with, and I have no particular memory. But somehow, not my mother at 85 or at 45 or at any specific age, but as a composite person, she will know what I need to do in that situation. Yeah. So I think we have you know, these continuing relationships uh, to build on that not just make us grow, but make them grow yeah. as well. Dennis, right? Dennis, actually, it's very interesting you said that. A colleague of mine, Dennis Kloss, um, talks about that when somebody dies, we carry an inner representation of them. Now, he did his work on parents who had lost children. And often what would happen is maybe the parent, the child died at six years old, maybe their daughter died at six years old, and they have a very distinct thought of what their daughter would be like at 16, at 26. Um, so, you know, so in many ways they, you know, they continue to see this changing child, this inner representation. And, and you know, and again, I, that's very, what, what class found is that's very normal and very natural. Yes, yes. And the, you know, the rituals you were talking about, too, I think are incredibly important. And just Let's want to see. mention a little thing that my father does. He lives alone. He is a widow. And uh, he has a little silver tray with all the people on it that has little figurines that represent all his family. Pat, those who are deceased, those who die, and those who are alive. And he makes no distinction, but he, he lights a candle and greets them every morning to make sure. And you know, when you're with him, you don't realize who has died and who hasn't, because it's all part of this little all part of, of his, his family. Memory, yes. And I think you know the rituals are really important. Many of us carry memories of you know maybe it's a piece of jewelry or something that's very, very that's very important. But there was one thing in your book that this was such a rich presentation that you didn't have a chance to talk about. You made me think about it when you said looking a year ahead, having direction, having hope. But there are some people who have what you're calling complicated <coughs> grief. Yes. Could you talk a little bit about okay. that? Yeah. Um, again, one of the things we try to talk about is that while most people deal with grief in generally therapeutic and generally helpful ways, um, some people have more complicated forms of grief. Often people who come from highly interdependent relationships, often people who come from highly ambivalent relationships. And you know, this can come out in, in, in you know, also people who have prior mental health issues. So for example, people who have a history of anxiety disorders or a history of depressive disorders, this will, you know, the loss will often trigger those. Uh, and, and, you know, and again, probably the best way of looking at it is complicated relationships or complicated circumstances like trauma. Uh, 
will often lead to complicated grief. Um, just in an, uh, actually a book that just came out this year, again, mostly aimed for professionals, really talks about the issue of complicated grief when grief is, uh, when grieving is complicated. So yes, I mean, again, to me, the, the key issue in the complication of grief is, is how disabling is grief. And if you've had a significant loss, and over, after a period of, few, of a few months even, or, or a few weeks even, you know, maybe six or eight weeks, you still, you know, again, you're going to grieve, you're going to have your bad days, you're going to have your, you know, your ups and downs. But if you really are disabled by grief, in other words, you really can't function in key roles. You can't go, you just can't work, you can't, uh, you can't function in your, in your family roles, you can't function in your work roles, uh, you know, you just find it hard to go back to school. That's a time to maybe talk to somebody um, and, and get some professional help. You know, grief shouldn't disable you. Uh, and if it disables you over time, that's, when, that's a sign that grief is complicated. Stop in the development. Stop in the development. Not you're, you're not moving. Forward. Yeah. Now, let me just ask one more question before we open it up, and that's on resilience. You mentioned resilience, which I find fascinating. And uh, George Bonanno, I think you mentioned him in your book, he's yeah. done these resilience studies where uh, he discusses some people who actually <coughs> will not necessarily benefit from a support group because if they're sitting with a group of people who are maybe one of the people, he, uh, groups that he looked at were the firemen after 9-11, and many of them really benefited from the support groups they were in, and some of them didn't because it reinforced yeah. their grief to sit and listen to other people repeat the same situations. Could you talk a little bit about sure. support groups and when they might be appropriate and how you select a support okay. group yeah. and those issues? These are questions that my organization often gets. And we usually hand them over to the uh, <laughs> Westchester Bereavement Group, their fabulous group that have a lot of different yeah. consultants. George. Yeah, George Bonanno, first of all, has is, is, is done some really great and interesting work. Um, and, uh, and my only criticism of him would be that sometimes I think, he's, I think he's been very good to introduce the notion of resilience and very good to remind us that people are resilient. I think sometimes, like, like a pioneer, he can overstate his case right, right. That, you know, that more people are resilient than actually are. Um, but I like his work tremendously. And as you say, I talk about his work a lot mm -hmm. in my book. Um, and... Um, and, and I think it's important to recognize that because grief is individual, there is no single treatment that works for everybody. There's no silver, what I call silver bullet. You know, some people will benefit from support groups. Some people will, will not benefit from support groups uh, for lots of reasons. And again, part of it is also how the support group is run. And support groups have to have what I consider, there's two things I think that, that they have to do to make them effective. One is that they cannot just be about shared anguish, where everyone talks about how bad they're doing in their grief. The, you know, the question is when somebody says, you know, like I'm tremendously angry or tremendously guilty, um, you know, to, to turn to the group for advice on coping. To say, well, how would you deal with that? What helped you? Now, again, what helped you may not necessarily help me, but it has to have an emphasis beyond just sharing the anguish, but really looking at coping. And the research has also shown that the support groups which also talk about growth generally do better. You know, so one of the things that I do in my support group is the first question I ask every session is, how has your story changed since the last time we were there? Since the last time we met, you know, we meet. At, we used to meet on a two-week basis. But how has your story changed? You know, what have you seen? Uh, and and people would often talk sometimes about negative things that happen, but also some things about positive things that happen. I was able to do this for the first time. I, you know, and and it's important again to have a focus on the support group that's not just about the sharing of reactions but that really includes how can we cope with these reactions and, how, and, and leaves open the possibility and the potential of growth. Can I get, just ask one question that we also get, always get, and I think I, many of you have the same question. How can we be supportive of a family that has had a very difficult loss? Uh, maybe it was a suicide, maybe it was a young child, or maybe it was a mother with young children at home. 
And the last thing we want to do is move away from them and not do anything, but very often we just don't know what to say or what to do. Could you give us some advice on that? And then sure. I'll open it up for everyone. I, I think the first piece of advice would be go back to what we said. What can you really offer that family? Are, are you a doer? Are you a listener? Um, don't invalidate their loss. You know, I mean, that's the worst thing you can do. Uh, to say, let's say, you know, somebody's child died, well, you, at least you have three more children. You know, uh, you know, or you're young, you're going to get married again. You can get married. You know, those are terrible things to say. Because basically they say, you know, they, they say, yeah, I, I may have three more children, but I don't have a Tommy. And Tommy was as important as the other three children to me. Or, you know, I may get married again in my life. I don't know what's going to happen. But not to this person that I love, not to this person I was committed to. So don't invalidate the loss. The best thing to say is, I'm sorry. Um, and then I think the second thing is to really be very explicit in what you can offer the family. You know, if you need to call me, call me at any time. You know, look at, I can bring some, you know, I know this may be a tough time. You know, or are you struggling with something? Can I, can I cook a meal for you? Can I do this? Can I, you know, I, you know, uh, my daughter is in soccer with your daughter. Can I, can I, you know, would it help if I picked her up for, you know, for soccer practice? You know, be very explicit and very, very practical, you know, if you're a doer, you know. So, so know what you can offer and don't just say if you need help. Be explicit about the kind of help you're able to give. One of the best stories I ever heard of support was a woman in my widow's group when we asked about what's been helpful about support. One woman said to me, is that I had a neighbor, you know, it was a hello neighbor, you know, she described it. I say hello to her every week. I knew she was a widow, she was older. And she said, when my husband died, uh, she came to the funeral, and I, that, that wasn't an expect, unexpected, you know, she was a neighbor. And she said, when she shook my hand, she pressed something metal into it and closed my hand around it. And she said, honey, I've been where you are. Some nights you're just not going to want to be alone. Here's the key to my house. Come over. And the, and the woman said, later on she told me, I was three years into my new marriage, and four years, five years after the bereavement, when I finally gave her back the key. She said it was like a talisman for me. You know, it's that very practical, very visible kind of support that people really need and that really helps. So that's a great answer. Do we Thank you. That? Yes. You mentioned the word significant loss. What are the ways in which you define significant losses as it relates to grief or the lack of grief? Okay. Um, significant loss is, is really means do I have an attachment to something? It, it, it's, it's very personal. Does that loss mean something to me? You know, somebody can lose a job and it's like, yeah, you know, I've lost jobs before. You know, I, I didn't like the job anyway. Another person could lose a job and be devastated by it. You know, my career was, my identity was tied up in this. So really, the, the only person who can say what is a significant loss is the person who's experiencing it. But again, the other piece is it, we have to be very careful not to judge how someone is grieving. Because some people will grieve in very open and very physical and very, you know, emotional ways. And other people may still be feeling a lot of grief, but they'll express it differently. Um, does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Anybody else? Yes, Oh, and then over here. Yes. Thank you so much. I had the good fortune to work with uh, Dr. Connie Bantz from the sure, I know Connie well. College of Marischal School of Nursing in Russia. And uh, on Sunday, I went to a Russian film festival at Concordia College. Okay. I'm not at Concordia. I'm at Concordia. At Hunter College. Okay. <laughs> I was wondering, say, boy, they do a lot here. <laughs> well, maybe I'm on Tim Marsh Boulevard. I don't know where. Oh, you okay. know, sorry. Yeah. Anyhow, I was at Hunter. And they showed a movie called The Babushkas of Chernobyl. Okay. The grandmothers of Chernobyl. That's right. And what amazed me is they are over a hundred women who are living in the radiation zone. Wow. The forbidden zone. And we're talking about 75 to 85 years old. And they had to crawl under the barbed wire fences and they've gone back to their ancestral homes. Yeah. And you know, all the things are there, 
the, the pictures and the sure. icon in the corner and all those things. And they have to plant their own food, okay, so that, and chase the wild boars and wolves away. Okay, these 80 year old women. And they had a medical tech there from the Chernobyl village, and they did a study. And they, these women who made it back have lived longer than the women who were evacuated yeah. and placed in other places. Yeah. So it's interesting that some, and they're together. I mean, you, you know, they do things as a group. Yeah, so and it's I, in, that's with the radiation and the food supply, radiation in the water, they survive. Yeah, and I think it shows the real importance. You know, we are social creatures. We are, we are wired to be social creatures. Um, and, and I think that really, you know, and what we've seen is, 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 is something that's not, that's analogous to that. We've seen that widows who find strong social support, either, you know, informally, just through being with other people, or formally through support groups, actually have higher mortality, um, uh, I mean, live longer than widows who don't have that support. Yeah, no, I, that's not what I want to say. Yeah, uh, that live longer than widows who don't have support. Social support is important for us. Somebody else had a hand up, yes. So I, I do a lot of, um, I'm a bereavement coordinator. Sure. But, but I also do a lot of work with caregivers, family caregivers, people who are living with someone who has dementia and Alzheimer's, all forms of dementia, and there's this ambiguous loss. Um, could you, can you just give me some of your thoughts on that? Sure. I, I think, with yeah, and, and, you know, and I call that in, in my book on disenfranchised grief, I call that, you know, psychosocial loss. Mm -hmm. The person is there, but they're not the person you knew. You know, they're, they're not the, the person you remember. And I call those women crypto widows mm -hmm. for the most part. And I think the first thing is just to validate that loss for them. You know, so when they say how tough it is, you know, just to, just to be there in a supportive, validating way that says, you know, yeah, I know this is tough. Because so many times they'll get, well, you know, he's still your husband, you still have him, you know, you'll, you'll get all these invalidating responses. So I think the first thing to do is just to, to stay supportive, to understand that's a loss. I think another thing is that when the husband dies, or when the, the doesn't always have to be the husband, uh, you know, but when the, when the person with dementia dies, there's often um, some very complex relationships, um, reactions, I mean, including one of relief. There's a wonderful book by uh, McGonagall and Ellison called Liberating Losses. Uh, and many of these people will experience that. Um, you know, there's a sense of freedom for many of them, and then a guilt over having that sense of freedom. But for others, you also have to realize, you know, one of, I, I think, really some of the significant work goes on there is, you know, people will say to them, well, now you can go back to your old life. Well, you can't. Your old life has changed. Uh, you know, the bridge part, the bridge, circle that you were part of or, you know, they've, they've moved on. They, they're doing other things now. They have other people. Um, and then also to recognize that for many people, caregiving itself becomes a meaningful activity. And as crazy as it seems, they may miss it. You know, that, that this gave their life meaning and gave their life significance. So I think the key thing is to validate loss, to explore the caregiving role, what it means to them. You know, there are, there are liabilities to being a caregiver, but there are also, um, you know, blessings to being a caregiver. You know, one, one, I did a book on caregiving. One caregiver said to me, you know what I like about this now? I said, I make all the decisions. <laughs> You know, um, and that was a very real practical thing. I decide what we're having for supper, you know. Um, and she's, you know, and, and this was a woman who, you know, didn't have a bad relationship with her husband, but she liked the sense of control um, that came. So explore the caregiving role with them, what it means to them, what its, its, its you know, its, its liabilities and legacies are, so to speak. Um, and then, you know, and, and then again, um, you know, explore the, and validate the varied reactions they have to the grief of psychosocial loss and then the grief of the death and, and what it means to, and, and again, give them help in reintegrating into life because that's often one of the biggest problems that caregivers face. You know, if you've been consumed by caregiving for 10 years, you know, how do I go back to, to my old life? And that's a real problem. We should add to that that the person, if he or she is aware, we've talked about ALS before, there are enormous losses that that person oh, sure. is experiences and going through a grief process 
Yeah. It came off our and he, even with and dementia, you know, there's yeah, a there's a sense of being aware that you're not longer yeah. able to, and this could be someone losing their sight, or it could be physical sure. ability or mental ability. Yeah, and even in the early years of dementia, I mean, the early phases of dementia, people will actually grieve. They'll know they have dementia. They'll know they're losing it, and they'll be very conscious of that. And later, they have a sense of what we call unwellness. Um, and what I mean by that is they know that something's wrong. They don't know what is wrong. They can't put their finger on it. But they know they should know what this is. You know, I should know what this is. I should know who you are. You know, I, I don't know who you are, but I should know who you are. And I'll have this sense of like uh, being sort of a stranger in a familiar terrain. You know, like there are things about this I should, you know, it's a very troubling experience, uh, even in the final stages. Any more questions? Please. Um, so I'm Albanian, and culturally, we really believe um, in dreams from the deceased. And oftentimes I hear my family members wonder why sometimes a family member will visit them in their dreams and not someone else. Yeah. It, did you, do you, I sure. know you spoke about it earlier, but is there like research behind why some people have those experiences? No, no, it, it tends, what, what I do with people when I have that, and, and some people would say, uh, you know, I wish I had a dream of him, or, you know, like, I, you know, I'll, I'll do an experience that I call, and I actually describe it in the book, called the virtual dream. So I'll say, let's create a dream, you know, let's, you know and, I'll, and I'll sort of take them through, and I'll say, choose, choose like, you know, and dreams are often symbolic, so I'll say, choose five objects that are like this person, that, you know, that you associate with this person. Choose a setting, and, and they'll do a virtual dream, and sometimes when they do that, they'll find that later on they do dream about it. But if not, they have the sense of saying, this is what a dream might look like. And, and often what you're really trying to explore is what, What's unfinished? You know, what, what's underlying this wish for a dream? Is there something I need to say to that person or something that person needs to say to me? And by creating a virtual dream, you sometimes resolve that underlying conflict. Okay. Well, I think it's wonderful to end on the note of a dream. <laughs> oh, thank you.